Today we're talking about our buddy, our pal, our dude. That's right, we're discussing the one person that's beside our hero through thick and thin, the ally archetype. They're such a great character, everybody would like to have them as their friend. Let's just make sure to properly put them in the hero's shadow and not be afraid to toss them off a mountain. What a pal. I'm DC Ferguson and this is the World Building Dojo. Before we get started, I want to give you all a quick reminder. Subscribers to my newsletter are getting a copy of Cora Blake, Arcane Agent, for free. This short story is a prequel to the Dragon's Dream Saga and a great chance to get started with my series. I linked the newsletter sign up in the comments. Make sure to sign up and get your free copy. Sometimes, the hero's journey is a treacherous slog through blasted lands, with trials and hardships the likes of which no mortal person could endure. From a literary perspective, the ally is a Swiss army knife of purposes. They give our hero someone to bounce off of, developing the hero through conversation and exploring their interpersonal relationships. This avoids the hero that you don't know. What is that? Well, if a hero's tale has one journey before them with one trial after another all by themselves, and then they get to the end and win, we've never really explored deeper into the character to know what kind of person they truly were. I mean, yeah, they vanquished the great evil, but what if they're mean to dogs? That is no hero I want. The point is, among an ally's many gifts is having someone to talk to and develop a relationship with. This ally can reveal the hero through interpersonal dialogue or just as something as simple as, you always do this sort of thing which informs us as the reader of habits and patterns that may otherwise seem like an isolated incident. Another great feature of the ally is to be our eyes, the audience. Sometimes the hero does great, big, even superhuman things. Sometimes they have powers beyond what we can understand or a burden or curse that separates us uh, from them in some way. The ally speaks for us and to us, reminding the hero of the real world, or having a very human reaction to these new powers, or giving us context for what the hero's powers mean in their world. Basically, it's important to consider the ally as a voice. Our voice, the voice of the hero's conscience, the voice of the hero's world, or the voice of the hero's tribe. He can be all of these things at once, or just one of them at times, but it can not be understated the versatility of the ally. Notice how often we have even just one ally and a hero walking alone in the wild, and we have no need for a narrator or inner monologues. That's because the interplay between them, even if it's confrontational, grows our character development by showing, not telling. So, the ally serves a bunch of purposes, we get that. What's the origin of the ally archetype, though? What symbolism do they show us, and what purpose does it serve in storytelling? Well, let's put on our tribal masks and take a trip back in time. In the classic hero's journey tales, the hero is often, if not always, accompanied by an ally. In the case of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, or Robin Hood and Little John, these were often rivals the hero bested along the way that became their best friends. Boy, oh boy, is there a lot of symbolism in that. The ally often stands in the shadow of the hero like this. The hero having bested them, they follow the hero along the journey in admiration of the rare person that was even greater than themselves. This serves a dual purpose, both to inform the audience that the hero is beneath no one, and they are the greatest champion ever known, and the only one with such power is to bring the light to the shadow and vanquish it from the land. But also, it tells our kin, the intended audience, that even the most powerful among us must give pause when they see the hero rise up in their tribe. Instead of jealousy, bitter rivalry, or what have you, it's important to recognize that the hero's journey is for the good of their people, the tribe. As such, they're going to need powerful allies, and who better than the second most powerful member of the tribe? There will be glory to be had, tales to be written, and it's better to be a part of the legend of this hero than to be a footnote of one of the trials they passed along the way. So, a lot of this again is about tribal unity, as we've discussed before. In the bonds of our tribe, the ally is our brother, a representation of all of us in the tribe. You sitting right there watching this, you can be the ally. If you see the hero rise up and begin a glorious journey, what are you waiting for? Go with them, add your name to the legend. One thing that is important to consider is scaling. 
we've discussed that before in this video. And even though that was about superpowers, it's really important to understand that the scaling is basically the same. Your hero has these amazing powers and is the only one that can use them to defeat the Shadow. Your ally sits directly under that hero. They couldn't defeat the Shadow themselves, but they can offer all the support the hero needs to push them on to victory. Now, this is an important distinction. How far beneath your hero the ally sits will be up to you, but there are risks with playing with the dials too much, and we'll get into that in a second. But we've also discussed in this video how we build our supporting character. Every single time, and I cannot stress this enough, every single time that we build the hero's journey, the ally must be beneath the hero. They have less power, they transform less through the course of the story, and their arc ultimately supports the hero. Why is this? Well, the main thing we have to avoid is an ally that is more interesting, more compelling, more likable, or in any way a plain better character than the hero. If that becomes the case, like with our man Balthier here, then we have utterly failed as a storyteller. Our audience doesn't care about our hero. I mean, sure, people like Han Solo, even love Han Solo, but a Luke Skywalker level hero? No way. For a myriad of reasons, not the least of which is that he is often self-serving, reluctant to do the right thing, and avoids danger whenever possible. All of these things make him a really good smuggler, a great ally, and a bad hero. Quite honestly, he's almost written too well as an ally. Han Solo is, without a doubt, one of the most by-the-numbers allies in modern hero journeys. He's the mold, an ally as old as the ancient tales that used to be relegated to oral tradition. When creating the hero's journey, you actually have to be careful you don't make your ally character so close to Han Solo that it actually invites comparison. So let's do a teardown, talking about our dials here and see where we get it right, see where we get it wrong. For that, we're going to compare Luke Skywalker and Han Solo in Star Wars to Vaughn and Balthier in Final Fantasy XII. Now, I'm going to use some numbers here on a scale of 1 to 5. They're completely arbitrary, but we're going for a visual understanding here, so work with me. Now, we just talked about cool factor, that kind of X factor that's hard to quantify, but let's start there. Luke Skywalker has the lightsaber, he's got the force, he's the hero, he wins the big battle. That's basically an automatic five. Now, Han is really cool, but he doesn't have a lightsaber, so we'll say four. Vaughn is from a small desert town and is basically a street urchin. Plucky and naive like Luke in Episode Four, he stays the hopeful voice of the hero party in Final Fantasy XII all the way to the end, despite having no real ties to the narrative. So, let's say three. Balthier is a sky pirate. Listen to my mouth words. When you say those two words together, you automatically get five cool points. If you're an author, those points are yours to lose. Surprisingly, that never happens in Final Fantasy XII, and Balthier has the five. So, let's talk about the climatic final battle here. Luke battles Darth Vader in a lightsaber fight aboard the Death Star, alone. So, yeah, five. Han Solo leads a tribe of teddy bears to victory against a faceless army on a forest planet. So, probably two, three if I'm being generous. Now... Vaughn mortally wounds the bad guy, Vane, aboard the Sky Fortress Bahamut, who then joins with some evil spirits and he turns into the usual, you know, three-form monster video game trope. So, we'll say it's a three. In the aftermath of that battle, though, the Sky Fortress Bahamut loses the ability to stay in the air and begins to fall on the city of Rabbit Aster. Even with the energy shield over the city, the sheer size of Bahamut will obl obliterate the city below. The party escapes the Sky Fortress, but Balthier and his companion Fran stay behind to repair the ship, giving it just enough juice to move it away from the city and crash to pieces. So Balthier makes a sacrifice play not just to save his team, but the whole city below. That is a hard five, and this is where problems start cropping up. Looking at transformation, Luke Skywalker goes from a two-handed, plucky young hero to a one-robot-armed Jedi Master. So, yeah, you guessed it. That's, that's a five. Han Solo goes from a selfish smuggler to the hero commander of a rebel unit. That's a four for sure. Uh, although, if you take the new trilogy into account, I'd honestly say he probably loses a point there. But Vaughn goes from a young, naive thief to a young, naive airship pilot. So, like, two at best. 
Balthier goes from a hotshot sky pirate to being someone willing to sacrifice himself to save an entire kingdom of people he doesn't know. I would say that's worth at least as much as Han, so we'll say a four. Can you start to see the problem here? The dials are all messed up in Final Fantasy XII. The intended protagonist is being overshadowed by a cooler, more interesting, more capable character that transforms more than the hero. You just absolutely cannot do this in a hero's journey because Balthier is flat out the main character of this story now. So we now understand the importance of scaling and the ally being in the hero's shadow. Let's talk about one more aspect of that, and I feel it's one that doesn't get a lot of attention. If Hollywood is in any indication, then writers straight up don't understand this at all. Your ally archetype is malleable. We probably have the most room with this archetype to have them be anything we want them to be. They could help from afar, be moral support, or be right in the thick of it, a Robin to our Batman. If done well, you can have the dial on them higher than the hero in some spots. Perhaps they're more intelligent or more charismatic, or they fill some other void that the hero is missing. The one thing they can't do is be useless. In a large number of cases where this line has been crossed, the hero would have been better off without the ally in the story at all. Again, we're going back to the worst example in movie history, Herman Ferguson and Judge Dredd. He's a coward, he's whiny, he complains about everything, he's not capable of physical tasks, and the hero spends a good portion of the film keeping him out of harm's way while trying to save his own skin. The writer gives this ally one or two shining moments where that little bit of help he can be saves the hero, but you could argue that the hero would have found another way, or the fact that this perfect plot device that only this useless side character can solve is contrived. Now, if you're comparing that to, say, a Sam from Lord of the Rings, you could make the argument Frodo literally never makes the trip without him, period. I don't even think anybody argues that point. Sam is so many things, a best friend, a confidant, the voice of his conscience, sometimes a nurse. It is Frodo's journey, and the corruption of the ring is his to bear. Sam could have walked away at any point, but he wasn't going to leave Frodo's side. Frodo comes out of the other side of the story in a photo finish with Sam. Those two are neck and neck in terms of bravery and heroism of the two. So here we see two extremes. One, I think I'd much rather a best friend that sees the hero to the finish line than an unfriendly whiner that needs saving every five minutes. Now, with all that out of the way, let's talk to a volleyball. So this is the first of many archetypes that absolutely, positively can be an inanimate object. We even have a ready-made example, and it's in the form of this week's deep cut, and that's the 2000 drama Castaway, starring Tom Hanks. Our protagonist is on a plane that crashes on a deserted island. Wilson is a volleyball, and our protagonist fashions a blood smear into a face so that he has someone to talk to. But DC, you just said that we need to avoid useless allies. Well, guy who talks to your monitor, I am willing to throw hands to defend Wilson on this one. The character of Wilson is not useless at all. In fact, the dual purpose he serves fits so well into the story that you actually feel bad that our protagonist gets separated from him. Think about it. In this film, our protagonist is literally making a life for himself on this island, alone. Wilson, whether he be imagined or not, is a conduit that is holding our protagonist's sanity together. The protagonist personifies him by giving him a contrarian voice, the voice of his own doubt, his worries, his fears. The masterful writing of this personification allows us to explore protagonist's thoughts and develop his character, again without the need for narration or internal monologue. Quite simply, by making him talk to a ball, we both get to know the protagonist and attach emotional ties to this inanimate object as much as he does. Now, I use this myself to a lesser degree in the Dragon's Dream Saga, our main character, Cora Blake, has a raven familiar that shares an emotional bond with her, an empathic link that allows her to know what he's feeling. I didn't want to do talking animals in this series, so the solution was more grounded. The thing is, her familiar is an animal. She talks to him, but he doesn't talk back. So I describe him calling at her with a sense of the emotion he feels at the time, and she infers his thoughts based on that. She might be right, she might be wrong, but either way, I'm personifying him. 
Truthfully, fantasy is full of things like this that haven't really been explored too much in books and film. Intelligent swords, magic mirrors, there's a lot of room here to harvest fertile new ground for developing characters out of inanimate objects. If you're going to take a stab at it, I wish you luck, but from what few examples we see of it and my own personal experience, I can actually offer a few pointers. The first thing is that landing the hero and their ally together should be treated as kismet of some kind. Grow the relationship through personification naturally. If your hero just starts talking to a mop on day one, your hero might be insane. The second thing is that the hero's own cruelty and malice is usually where a drop can happen, throwing the object a great distance or kicking at it in anger. You can be more cruel to an inanimate object, and if that cruelty is so shocking that even our own hero feels remorse, then we draw sympathy and further personify the object as well. Third, and most important, make sure you don't get a case of forgotten familiar syndrome. Forgotten Familiar Syndrome was a term my friends and I used when we played Dungeons & Dragons to refer to the player like a sorcerer that has an object ally and they forget they have them. None of my books contain that happening with Cora Blake, but that's because editing is a wonderful thing. There were times I'd have to go back an entire chapter or two and restructure the whole dang thing because I forgot to mention the Raven a single time. So if you're going to use it, never forget it's always there. The ally is our bestest bud, coolest friend, and we couldn't make it through the journey without them. Always be certain to develop them fully as a person first, in the hero's shadow second, and then let them bounce off each other naturally. Their own relationship might even surprise you. Once again, thanks so much to every single person that saw last week's video and were kind enough to leave an anonymous donation. If you haven't already heard, this is Liana. This beautiful lady is my little girl and one of the most important people in my life. Liana is on the spectrum, which has its own fair share of hero trials for her to overcome. And right now, she's participating with an absolutely wonderful organization called Needs up in Boston. And they're fundraising to get her a service dog. How cool is that, right? So, if you'd like to contribute, I have a link for the fundraising page in the description down below. Also, don't forget to sign up for my newsletter. The link is also in the comments. And you're going to get Cora Blake, Arcane Agent, totally free. You'll also get cool news about what I'm working on in books and here on the channel. And it comes loaded with cool authors and promotions for fantasy and sci-fi. Now, don't forget to like and subscribe to hear about new videos. And as always, I'm DC Ferguson. Now have fun and get crafting.